Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning, whether you're here in person or you're um, joining us on Zoom. Wherever you are on life's journeys, you are welcome here. It's one of the models of the United Church of Christ, and certainly we believe that. This light is going on and off by itself. That's interesting. <laughs> um, Pastor Jen is on annual leave this week, so today's sermon, as well as a choir anthem, are coming to us from our sister church, First Plymouth UCC in Lincoln, Nebraska. And since we're still in Pride Month in June, um, the video that I selected today for the message comes from their service of two weeks ago, um, which was when they celebrated Pride Sunday in Lincoln. And I hope you will find the message as meaningful as I did. As we begin our service, I invite you to reflect on the ways in which you might have recognized God's presence in your life during this past week. And I trust that this week, we will find that God is still speaking in our lives when we take time to be still and to listen. Let us read responsibly our call to worship as found in today's bulletin, after which we will listen to the ringing of our church bell. Once again, we have gathered here to praise God. We have come together to increase our understanding of how we can serve others, following Jesus' example. May we be open to new ways in which we can be the church. As we sing, pray, and share our lives with each other, may we recognize Christ's presence among us. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and sing our song of praise. Come, O Fount of Every Blessing, number 459 in the New Century Hymnal.
join me in reading today's opening prayer as found in the bulletin. We'll read it in Loving, Loving God, God as, as we hear your word for us today, today let, let us be open to new perspectives and new understandings. When we feel inadequate and when we doubt our ability to be the church which we envision, remind us that in your grace, when we are open to change and are listening with our whole heart, you will show us the way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and we will sing hymn number 328 in the United Methodist hymnal, Surely the Presence of the Lord, and we will sing that twice. children, 
open wide your hearts also. May God bless our understanding of today's word. in 
this sacred space this day. Open our hearts and our minds to that possibility of a God that is still speaking, a God that is still present, a God who is still challenging us to be more. And through that this day, I pray that we might have hearts that are on fire for this liberating God of grace. That we might know you more deeply, follow you more clearly every single day of our lives. And that on this day, the day that our God has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. On this day, may we open our hearts to one another as well as to you. And now, gracious God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay. Mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this weekend we are celebrating pride here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and it was a joy to share with so many of you over this weekend as we marched around the Capitol twice, as we observed so many who were on the side streets and the sidewalks celebrating pride together, and the ways in which we were a visible witness to God's radically inclusive love. Uh, to see folks who were stood on those sidewalks just perhaps imagining for themselves that there could be such a place like First Plymouth that will welcome them into their sacred space. It always surprises me no matter how popular a church may be in a particular community and that there are still people who think that First Plymouth is the best kept secret in town. Just as it is for us at Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ, a, a congregation of 53 years that has served predominantly the LGBTQ plus community. That there are still folks even in our city that still do not know that Cathedral of Hope exists. Amazing to watch people who perhaps wanted to see themselves on that parade. That they could open themselves to that limitless possibility of a God that welcomes each and every one of us. But we're not the first to experience that. It's experienced in our sacred text over and over again of people who believe that somehow they were not welcome in God's house, that they were not a part of the table of radical inclusion. And we believe that it is the one we call Jesus, the Christ, who came to perhaps reform their religion of their day. A religion that had also become exclusive, a religion that had also become dogmatized, a religion that had also become inaccessible to the masses. So much so that religion had become, in some ways, irrelevant, only for high days and holidays. And when we observe the ministry of Jesus, we see him so often on the outside of the temple, ministering to people where they are at. In fact, Perhaps Jesus would have been on that pride parade group with us yesterday, walking alongside, shoulder to shoulder, with people who are believing that there is a different way. I'm saying a better way, but a different way. In some ways, the Christian church is not dissimilar to the ways in which Jesus found the temple. And in similar ways, we who are part of the United Church of Christ and other denominations like us, let us not ignore our United Methodist friends who have just fought the good fight and who have become part of this radical inclusion. Those who are standing for the margins, those who are standing for the oppressed, those who are standing for a different way. As we read our sacred text this morning, we read from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. There's a reason why there's two letters. The first letter is written to this emerging community who are beginning to navigate what it looks like to be God's people, Jews and Greeks alike, Romans. 
those who were not yet part of the Jewish faith, but who had yet began this journey to find this one who we call Jesus. And in their persecution and their involving ministry, they too were struggling with what it means to be radically inclusive. What it means to draw together peoples from different backgrounds, from different societies, coming together as one body. In Paul's first letter, Paul spends much of his time reminding them that this gospel of Jesus is not only one of radical inclusion, but is also one of radical welcome. And we're not called to lord it over one another, but to find that place of equity and equality challenging the systems of power and the systems of oppression so that they might all be one in Christ Jesus. They must have heeded some of Paul's caution. For by the time we get to Paul's second letter in Corinthians, he draws them not from the place of, of, of finding right order, but to finding a place within them that would deepen and strengthen their spiritual journeys, their spirituality. And we can't read Paul's letters without understanding that Paul was once Saul, a persecutor of the church. And so we look at scripture through his lens, through the lens of the one who was the oppressor, and the one who ultimately became the liberator. As we read through that lens, we ask ourselves, where do we find ourselves in the story? Where do we place ourselves? Today, as I read that second letter, those verses from Scripture of Paul's experience, we know too that that is the experience of many in our world this day. Those who have struggled to find faith in the face of oppression, those who have struggled to find their place at the table in a world and in a church where we are so polarized by so many different things. As I read this sacred text for myself as a queer identified person, who's someone who's been accused of being a practicing homosexual, to which I say I am no longer practicing, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> Rather than 
an understanding that the Apostle Paul also had to struggle with his own redemption, his own salvation. And that he too was given grace from the one who was Saul to the one who became Paul. But if that grace was extended to him, why should it not be extended to others? And it may be that we don't always agree, or don't always understand someone else's life, but that is not our job. Our job is to welcome and to provide grace and to provide an opportunity for others to grow in their spirit, in their journey, and to find, as Paul says, that when we work together with God, we enter into and entreat so that we might accept the grace of God in us all. In my journey, 33 years now as an ordained pastor in the Christian church, I have faced calamities, beatings, not yet imprisonment, although I did once get arrested on a social justice march, but I have kept to what I believe, that God has no favorites, and that God loves us just the way that we are, no exceptions, and that if God can accept me the way that I am, accept someone else for the way that they are and praise God for it. The time is now and people are leaving the church in numerous numbers more than they are arriving. It is incumbent on the United Church of Christ, First Plymouth and Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ to be a voice of grace and love in the world. To speak its truth to power and to find its mission this day so that the church might be redeemed and the church might find its home one more time. It is people like you and me, with our doubts, with our questions, with our desire to be those people of inclusion, to speak to our world this day and to reclaim our voice of liberation our voice of hope, not just for LGBTQ people, but for so many others who are looking to you and me to find the church of love one more time. That is our mission. That is what Jesus calls us to at the end of Matthew's Gospel, to go into all of the world, not just some, with all of the world and to baptize people in the name of this God of love. Why do we make it so complicated? Why? Even the eunuch found that as he journeyed on that chariot that day, that the chariot should be stopped when he said, what is preventing me from being baptized? It was not a confirmation class. There was no Bible study to make sure that you knew all 66 books of the Bible. But the chariot was stopped that day. And the eunuch who was seen on the outside was baptized and found their home. What would it be like if the world could be like that? What would it be like if the church could be like that. I believe that not only would every pew in this congregation would be full, but you'd be building a second and third and fourth balcony to keep the people in. Because that kind of love is infectious. That is the fragrance of Christ that comes from God's people. Not those who stood on the outside of the parade yesterday holding up their big banners saying repent for the sins of death are upon you. But like the woman who stood alone holding her banner with an arrow pointing towards them and saying Jesus would not do this. That is the good news of Jesus. But the Apostle Paul would end this chapter, verse
verse 13 with these words. We have spoken frankly to you, first Plymouth, Lincoln, Nebraska. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our afflictions, but only in yours, for in return I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. Can we be that church? And if so, hold on, because there is no time like the present the honor and glory of the one that I fall in love with every single day, Jesus, who I call the Christ. And the people of God we say, and the people of God we say, and the people of God we say, let's break down some walls first, Lord. God bless you this morning. Amen. we come to the point in our service where we share our joys and concerns with one another. So if you have something, please raise your hand, and I'll try to make the microphone work for you. I have no clue. <laughs> Do you? Okay, does anyone have anything they would like to share today? Washington for surgery, and the anesthesiologist called it off because of the congestion that I felt from my grandkids that I got to be with. So, the lesson was that that bomb was beautiful. 
students that are four and six in the room are the baby, and that was invaluable. But it set me back in. And then we had surgery on the eleventh of July, so I'll be getting back up there in about ten days. And I'd really like some prayer because there's strangeness to what. First, I had an abscess behind the wall of the septum, then collapsed, and even the, the head guy up at Washington, who's head of facial plastic surgery department, all that, he sees gunshot wounds in the face. He's not had a presentation just like mine. So it's it's been tough dealing with the infections behind the wall that I didn't get the symptoms, and now that I have this virus and set back, and I really need some good healing so that I can have a successful surgery and something that won't keep failing us. But the blessing of being with these grandkids and having Murphy on the close by for quite a while is it's worth it all. Well, for the joy of Kathy spending time with her children and grandchildren, let us all say, thanks, thanks be to God. God. And then, Kathy, know that we all <coughs> raise you in our prayers for a successful surgery. Lord, hear our prayers. I want to share a note I got from our daughter, Anna, who lives in Southern California in Orange County. Um, she just sent me this note, texted to me yesterday. She said, I've been walking around the Orange County Pride Festival for an hour or so. And I'm happy to see that currently the number of churches with booths and tables vastly outweighs the homophobic religious protesters. I've seen two UCC churches, at least two Disciples of Christ churches, Unitarians, a Methodist coalition, the Episcopal Diocese, and the Ecumenical Catholics, which I only just learned existed. That's a good word from what's going on in Orange County, the most conservative of many of the counties in Southern California. And so for that message, let us all say thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> and I also have um, got a message from Mar um, Madeline yesterday. She's asking for prayers for her granddaughter. Melissa will be receiving her second round of chemo beginning on Tuesday. So for Melissa, Lord, Lord hear our, our prayers. So if there's anything you would like to share, but you want to keep it quiet and just share it within yourself, Take a few moments to do that, and then I will pray. Loving God, open wide our whole hearts to your presence, giving us room for new beginnings and new realizations. Breathe on us your spirit of love. Where we have put barriers of judgment, remove them. Where we have built walls of resistance, tear them down. And where we have limited the possibilities of inclusion and of acceptance, open our minds to new understandings. Grant us compassion for those who struggle with injustice and rejection. May those who encounter us individually and as a church, feel the openness and love that we seek to share with everyone. May our kindness be sincere and our love be genuine. And now we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our 
Our closing song is Soon and Very Soon in the United Methodist Hymnal, number 706. I would invite you to rise in body or in spirit and sing. Thank you.